The title of this video series is Strange Brew, a reference to the odd conglomeration of special interest groups whose votes in 2016 combined to unexpectedly and seemingly against all odds thrust Donald Trump into the role of President of the United States. The groups varied from disillusioned blue-collar workers who felt left behind by the mainstream of both political parties to industrialists eager to support someone who would roll back both taxes and regulations on their industries, to Christian groups eager to roll back the Supreme Court's past rulings on abortion and the rights of gays. The word strange in the series title particularly refers to how strange it is for these groups to find common cause in such an unusual leadership choice. You would not historically expect unemployed blue collar workers and millionaire and billionaire business people to be in harmony in choosing leadership. However, the first four entries in the series went even deeper into the significance of strange, particularly focusing on the role of what I have dubbed Donald Trump's strangest bedfellows. That is a description of the strange brew that is made up of a hodgepodge of leaders of a large portion of the evangelical Christian movement in America who have embraced Trump as a man they are absolutely convinced was ordained by God to make America great again and has been guaranteed by God to put in place policies that will empower the agenda of these leaders to mold American government and society into the image which they desire. Some of these leaders are truly strange in their own right, such as Donald Trump's closest spiritual advisor, TV evangelist and name it and claim it prosperity gospel proponent, Pastor Paula White, who gave the invocation at Trump's inauguration. Or disgraced and incarcerated in the 1980s, but now back in the saddle, TV evangelist Jim Baker, with a new younger wife he married in 1998 after he got divorced from Tammy Faye and got out of jail. On the Jim Baker show throughout 2015 and 2016, Jim and Lori mixed hosting self-proclaimed modern prophets who offered direct words from God Almighty about the great coming presidency of Donald Trump with offers of overpriced bulk survival food and supplies so that viewers can live through the Great Tribulation period Jim insists is imminent. Or here's another very strange bedfellow, TV evangelist Benny Hinn, who knocks over individuals, small groups like the Venezuelan army group shown on the right, and sometimes whole audiences of thousands of people with the alleged power of the Holy Spirit, aided by waving his arms or snapping his white suit jacket at them, like a jock snapping a wet towel at other jocks in a football locker room, or wielding that jacket like a baseball bat to knock them down. Pastor Benny is a good friend of Pastor Paula, and she brought him with her to the inauguration in Washington, D.C. in 2017. They've traveled together before that, as you can see from this two-page spread in the National Enquirer in 2010, about a trip they took together to England. Or there's retired firefighter turned prophet Mark Taylor, who electrified the circles of Donald's strangest bedfellows in 2015, when he claimed to have heard from the Lord clear back in 2011 that Trump was chosen by God to become president. His claims were soon turned first into a big selling book and then a full-length movie produced by Jerry Falwell Jr.'s Liberty University. Here's a snippet of his alleged prophecy, just as he claims to have heard it in 2011, long before Donald announced his candidacy for the 2016 election. The Spirit of God says, I have chosen this man, Donald Trump, for such a time as this. For as Benjamin Netanyahu is to Israel, so shall this man be to the United States of America. For I will use this man to bring honor, respect, and restoration to America. America will be respected once again as the most powerful and prosperous nation on earth, other than Israel. The dollar will be the strongest it has ever been in the history of the United States and will once again be the currency by which all others are judged. <laughs> 
The Spirit of God says, The enemy will quake and shake and fear this man I have anointed. They will even quake and shake when he announces he is running for president. It will be like the shot heard across the world. The enemy will say, What shall we do now? This man knows all our tricks and schemes. We have been robbing America for decades. What shall we do to stop this? The Spirit says, Ha! No one shall stop this that I have started. The Spirit of God says, I will protect America and Israel, for this next president will be a man of his word. When he speaks, the world will listen and know that there is something greater in him than all the others before him. This man's word is his bond, and the world and America will know this, and the enemy will fear this, for this man will be fearless. Even mainstream news media will be captivated by this man and the abilities that I have gifted him with and they will even begin to agree with him, says the Spirit of God. But those strange bedfellows from the fringes of charismatic televangelism weren't the only religious people who became part of the strange brew that became Donald Trump's voter base. More mainstream religious leaders from denominations like the Southern Baptists crowded around him, too. Such as Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, and Jerry Falwell's son, Jerry Falwell Jr. A decade ago, they and other Baptist pastors and denominational leaders would have condemned the charismatic televangelists like Paula and Benny as purveyors of false doctrine and warned their flocks to stay away from them. Now they have made very strange common cause around a man that, a decade ago, they would all have condemned as a greedy, crass, profane, utter heathen. How did we get here? How did the most zealously religious, the most piously inclined folks in America, folks who supposedly were dedicated to spreading the gospel of the simple carpenter of Nazareth, come to embrace a man with this lifestyle and reputation? How did they become convinced he was the only one who could save the nation and put in policies and programs to make America Christian again? How did they end up in a strange brew with right-wing politicians, libertarian economists, and billionaires? And how did Donald Trump end up in that brew with all of them? There really are answers to those questions, and it would be convenient if the answers were simple, but they aren't. In the previous entry in this series, we went back to the 1950s, then further back to the 1930s, to pick up some clues about how we got to the present circumstances in America. In this and later entries, we will need to go back even earlier. There is a thread running like a winding road through American history for almost the past century leading to this strange brew moment in time. But it's a thread with a number of unexpected twists and turns. In this and later episodes, we will go back to the beginning and follow it forward, combine it with some of the factors explained in previous entries in this series, and see if we can sort out how the strange brew developed. As most people following the news today realize, Russia plays prominently in the story thread out at this end of history, Vladimir Putin's Russia. But strangely enough, Russia also plays a prominent part in the story as the thread begins a century ago. Starting with this man, this is Tsar Nicholas II, royal head of the Romanov dynasty of Russia, rulers of Russia since 1613. Nicholas became emperor in 1894. Even if you didn't recognize his picture, it is likely that you at least heard him mentioned in world history class back in high school. But if you're anything like I was until recently, you're likely unaware of the extent throughout Europe of his family circle. For some reason, high school history courses typically ignored mentioning just how inbred the ruling heads of Europe had become by the turn of the last century. Nicholas was closely related to several monarchs in Europe. His mother's siblings included Kings Frederick VIII of Denmark and George I of Greece, as well as the United Kingdom's Queen Alexandra, consort of King Edward VII, 
Nicholas was also a first cousin of both King Hakan VII and Queen Maud of Norway, as well as King Constantine I of Greece. But most amazing is this little tidbit. Tsar Nicholas, his wife Alexandra, and Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany were all first cousins of King George V of the United Kingdom, as all were grandchildren of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom. Yes, in one way you might say that World War I was a really, really enlarged family feud. The three cousins likely played with each other at extended family gatherings in their childhood and hung out occasionally with each other in their young adulthood. Nicholas and George actually looked more like twins than cousins. By 1913, all three were married with several children and occupying the thrones of their respective countries, but still getting together on occasion. Including an occasion in 1913 when Wilhelm invited most of his extended family from throughout Europe to the wedding of his daughter in Berlin when both of these photos were taken. It was the last great social event that brought together European royalty before World War I began 14 months later on July 28, 1914. We've gone back from the second decade of the 21st century to the second decade of the 20th century because something happened then, besides the World War, that shook all the inbred crowned heads of Europe and eventually the uncrowned aristocracy of the United States. Those crowned heads of Europe and their families and dynasties and a small circle of aristocrats with which they surrounded themselves had been in charge for a long time. You might say that they represented the 1% of their era. Although some of the nations were moving slowly toward a more modern concept of democracy, or at least a bit wider spread of wealth and prosperity than in medieval feudal times, there was still a very deep divide between the lifestyle of the rich and famous royalty and aristocracy and the lifestyles of the peasants and the urban working classes. One place where this was particularly evident was Russia. At the turn of the last century, there were tens of millions of Russian peasants and workers, mostly leading very bleak lives. And then there were those Russians who didn't lead bleak lives. They were the aristocracy and royalty, with Tsar Nicholas II, Emperor of Russia, and his family at the pinnacle. In 1903, while the peasants ground away at their miserable little lives, the Tsar decided to throw a royal costume ball for 400 of his family members and aristocratic friends. It was held in February in the Tsar's Winter Palace in the Russian capital of St. Petersburg. The 1903 costume ball was technically being held in honor of the 290th anniversary of the Russian Romanov dynasty, which began in 1613. The Romanovs were, at the time, one of Europe's oldest ruling families and almost certainly the one with the most absolutist powers, and likely the family also with the ability to show off the most amount of bling at such a bash. Up until recently, the photos available of that ball were all in black and white, giving a very faded impression of the elegance and extravagance of it all. But amazing Russian artist Olga Chernina recently brought the ball to life by colorizing many of the portraits taken of the Tsar and his guests at the occasion. Let's take a look at some of these colorized photos, as well as more of the collection that has not yet been given the color treatment. The most stunning facet of the event was the costumes, which were all exquisitely designed by one famous artist who consulted with historians to make lush creations that would evoke the styles of the 17th century during the reign of the second Tsar of the Romanov dynasty. The robes were mostly of rich silken brocades of gold and silver and dramatic colors. Held during the bitter Russian winter and in a cavernous palace without modern central heating, there was no worry about being uncomfortably warm wearing such thick clothing. Each woman 
wore a unique exotic headdress done in the popular style of that 17th century period. Here is Tsar Nicholas dressed in imitation of his 17th century ancestor Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich with his wife Alexandra known as the Tsarina dressed as Mikhailovich's first wife Empress Maria. Like the women's costumes, the men's costumes were also designed by the same artist and made of lush materials and in a wide variety of elegant styles that appeared to be versions of military dress uniforms. Each uniform was accompanied by a unique headdress also, varieties of the sort of tall fur hat favored by the men of nobility of the 17th century. But as fancy as the men were, they couldn't hold a candle to the elegance and variety of the women's robes and headdresses. The surface of the brocade robes of most of the women were studded with a variety of pearls and jewels held in place by intricate embroidery. The traditional Russian headdress each wore is called a kakoshnik. Even Russian peasant women throughout the centuries have worn kakoshniks on very special occasions, but those have been fairly simple versions. Each kakoshnik at this occasion was adorned with a fabulous collection of the best of the family jewels. Unlike all the other women, the Tsarina was not wearing a kakoshnik, but a jewel-encrusted crown. It has been estimated that her whole outfit, including the crown, would be worth the equivalent today of about $11 million. Here's a sample of a few more of the jewel-encrusted ladies whose photos from that night have been colorized by Olga Chernina. At some point, the whole crowd got together on the stairway to the Grand Theater of the Palace and had a dynasty portrait taken. I don't know what kind of memories each person at that ball had of the event in later years, but one participant who was there that night, Tsar Nicholas's brother-in-law, Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich, shared some thoughts long after the event. He recalled the occasion in his memoirs as the last spectacular ball in the history of the empire, but a new and hostile Russia glared through the large windows of the palace. While we danced, the workers were striking and the clouds in the Far East were hanging dangerously low. Yes, hostility was indeed growing outside that palace as they danced. It took a few years to come to a head, but indeed it came. Here's a photo of Tsar Nicholas and his lovely family in 1908, five years after the famous ball. And here they are, ten years after that, depicted on the evening of July 17, 1918. No photographer was present. This is an artist's representation of the evening, sketched shortly after that date. Yes, that is a representation of the assassination of Nicholas and his wife and five children in a drab basement somewhere in the hinterlands of Russia, far from their elegant palace. Right in the middle of World War I, Nicholas had been forced to abdicate his throne by the Russian Revolution that began March 8, 1917. His abdication came on March 16th. Since that time, for over a year, he and his family had been under house arrest at various locations in Russia. He had hoped they might be able to escape into exile somewhere, Britain preferably, but his hopes were never realized. On the night pictured, his family was unexpectedly ushered into the basement of the house where they were confined, 
and summarily all put to death by bullet and or bayonet. What crushed the Tsar's hopes that he could experience a dignified exile hosted by his close cousin, George V of England? When Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, George's first cousin, was overthrown in the Russian Revolution of 1917, the British government offered political asylum to the Tsar and his family, but worsening conditions for the British people and fears that revolution might come to the British Isles led George to think that the presence of the Russian royals would be seen as inappropriate. Despite the later claims of Lord Mountbatten of Burma that Prime Minister Lloyd George was opposed to the rescue of the Russian imperial family, the letters of Lord Stamfordham suggest that it was George V who opposed the rescue against the advice of the government. The Tsar and his immediate family remained in Russia, where they were killed by Bolsheviks in 1918. King George V essentially signing his own cousin's death certificate. Yes, the reality is that George understood that some, if not many, of the underlying causes of the Russian Revolution, which eventually established a communist government in that country, weren't unique to that country. The lower classes all over Europe, including in Great Britain, as you can see in these photos of the slums in England, had been long stirred up with resentment against the inequity of the distribution of wealth in their own lands. Severe poverty, hunger, and harsh living and working conditions among the peasants and urban working class, while the aristocracy lived in opulence, were common throughout the continent. The horrors of World War I exacerbated these circumstances to unbearable levels almost everywhere. The lower classes had no investment in the reasons for the war. It was caused by disputes between the aristocracies of the various countries. Yet the poor were forced to bear the worst of the suffering caused by the war. Thus, one of the first things the Bolsheviks did when they came into power in Russia was to sign a treaty with Germany and withdraw from the war. By the way, speaking of that revolution, if you have always thought, as I did, that all of it was a carefully planned set of events carried out by a totally organized, large group of rebels, think again. As one author has put it, the March Revolution in 1917 was not a planned affair. Lenin was in Switzerland. The Bolsheviks did not even have a majority in the St. Petersburg Soviet, and the Russian ruling body had not wanted the end of the Romanovs. So why did it happen? The ruling dynasty must take a great deal of the blame. Nicholas was an ineffective ruler who had let his wife dominate him to such an extent that the royal family became inextricably linked to a disreputable man like Gregory Rasputin. Rasputin was the mad monk who wormed his way into the royal family circle with claims of supernatural powers, but was viewed by most people outside the royal family as a complete charlatan who was manipulating the Romanovs. As one online Russian history site puts it, the ruling elite failed to realize that the people would only take so much. They took their loyalty for granted. In February, March, 1917, lack of food, lack of decisive government, and the cold temperatures at that time of year in that area of Russia averaged minus four degrees Fahrenheit, pushed the people of St. Petersburg onto the streets. The people of St. Petersburg did not call for the overthrow of Nicholas. It happened as a result of them taking to the streets calling for food. People had to burn their furniture to simply get heat in their homes. Very few would tolerate having to wait in lines in the extreme cold just for food, food that might run out before you got to the head of the queue. The spontaneous reaction to police shooting at protesters in a bread queue showed just how far the people of St. Petersburg had been pushed. That it ended with the abdication of Nicholas II was a political byproduct of their desire for a reasonably decent lifestyle. In other words, ultimately, communism didn't initially come to power in Russia through a careful, long-term, clandestine program of education and persuasion of the lower classes to understand and agree with the political and economic theories of Marx and Engels so that they would eventually cooperate in conducting a carefully organized revolution. It came to power as a result of people just wanting an answer to their desperate plight and other people ready and waiting to offer them what looked like just such an answer through a change of leadership. Music
and thus we come to the concern of George V of England. For of course the lower classes in England had many of the same exact complaints as the lower classes in Russia. It just wasn't as cold in England. The lower classes in England could be expected to have sympathy for the plight of the peasants and working classes of Russia, not for Tsar Nicholas and his pampered family. Best not to agitate the British lower classes to ponder their own relationship to pampered royalty in England in the middle of the hellish war. If Nicholas and family showed up on the shores of England, the notoriety of the situation would make fodder for lurid stories in the English newspapers. But, you may ask, what does any of this have to do with the United States in that era? For, of course, America was literally founded as an escape from the system of royalty in the old world. It was founded on the idea that all men are created equal and all equally have the right to pursue happiness, not just pursue enough food to not starve and enough fuel to not freeze during the winter. For a brief moment after the American Revolution, some men actually tried to convince George Washington that he could aspire to being a king of the new nation, but he would have none of it. The generational castes of Europe were to be no more. No more huge divide between aristocracy and the common man. Well, at least there were to be no castes among white men. The Native Americans and the African slaves were another topic. So, what would the United States have to fear from the spread of communist ideas or the restlessness of peasants? this. For although there was no American royalty in 1776, that was before the game-changing industrial revolution. Once venture capitalism created a path to untold wealth through capitalizing on the availability of masses of workers who could be forced to work 16-hour days at slave labor wages under often horrifically unsafe conditions, in order to create giant, hugely profitable companies a new kind of royalty arose in the United States. The connection with the old kind of royalty was unmistakable, and the new kind of royalty was dubbed very early with terms like robber barons. The fruit of this development was masses of downtrodden urban working people and rural farmer peasants supporting the luxuries of the few who differed little from their European counterparts. And strangely enough, the new royalty in the new world made no effort to hide this reality before the start of the World War. No, they flaunted it. For instance, by 1897, the U.S. had been in the midst of an economic depression since 1877. It was so exacerbated by a financial crisis known as the Panic of 1893 that the whole economy tumbled into the worst depression in its history to that point, in some ways more severe than that of the Great Depression of the 1930s, if not quite as long and drawn out. Like the later crash of 29, it affected not just the working classes, but even the newly prosperous middle class. This cartoon from 1893 optimistically proposes that Uncle Sam, through a business revival, will defeat the big bad wolf of hard times. Stock prices tumbled, 600 banks failed, 15,000 businesses failed, over 70 railroad companies failed. Unemployment in Pennsylvania hit 25%, in New York it was 35%, and in Michigan the rate hit 43%. Soup kitchens popped up everywhere to help feed the destitute. Facing starvation, people chopped wood, broke rocks, and sewed in exchange for food. Some women resorted to prostitution to feed their families. As in later financial crises, including right up to today, many people lost their life savings when the banks failed. Even many in the middle class could not pay their home mortgages. Even for those who actually still had jobs, income was extremely meager on the bottom rungs of society. The average salary of an unskilled factory employee working a six-day, 60-hour week would have been about $400 a year. That was the equivalent of about $12,000 in modern times. But many made less than that, leaving large numbers of families always on the edge of destitution. Many American black families of the time, as well as families within the ghettos of new immigrants from Europe, subsisted 
on far less than that. In 1890, well-known Danish-American social reformer, muckraking journalist, and social documentary photographer, Jacob Rees published a book titled How the Other Half Lives. It chronicled in words and photos his experiences visiting the slums of New York. One of the earliest photographers to use the new flash photography technology, he was able to go right into the darkest inner parts of tenement slums in order to bring to light the horrific conditions so many were living under at the time. You could go into a snazzy restaurant in New York City at that time and get a sirloin steak dinner with potatoes, bread and butter and coffee for 85 cents. But even though that amount seems astonishingly low by our own price standards, at a salary of about $1.25 a day to feed, clothe, and house a family of maybe four or five or six children, it would have been out of the question for the average worker to even consider one of those cheap steak dinners. Of course, there could be more than one income in a family. Lots of wives and children, even down to preschool age, work to help supplement the family income. Another photographer, social reformer, and sociologist, Louis Hine, also focused on revealing the plight of the poor. In 1908, Hine became the photographer for the National Child Labor Committee, and for a decade took photos documenting child labor to aid the committee's lobbying efforts to end the practice. Here are a few of his photos and the descriptions he added as captions to the photos. Children on the night shift going to work at 6 p.m. on a cold, dark December day. They do not come out again until 6 a.m., a 12-hour shift. When they went home the next morning, they were all drenched by a heavy, cold rain and few or no wraps. Two of the smaller girls with three other sisters work on the night shift and support a big, lazy father who complains he's not well enough to work. He loafs around the country store. The oldest three of these sisters have been in the mill for seven years, and the two youngest for two years. The latter earns 84 cents a night. This is in Whitnell, North Carolina. One of the spinners in Whitnell Cotton Mill, she was 51 inches high, has been in the mill one year sometimes works at night, runs four sides for 48 cents a day, likely for a 12-hour shift. When asked how old she was, she hesitated and then said, I don't remember, then added confidentially, I'm not old enough to work, but I do just the same. Out of 50 employees, there were 10 children about her size. Some families had more than four or five kids, so it was no doubt a relief to have them working as soon as possible to supplement the family income. Little Fanny, seven years old, 48 inches tall, helps her sister in Elk Cotton Mill in Fayetteville, Tennessee. Her sister said, yes, she helps me right smart, not all day, but all she can. Yes, she started with me at six this morning. The two girls belong to a family of 19 children. So they'd start him young to bring home the bacon, such as this little five-year-old newsboy in St. Louis, Missouri, who sold papers to the public by jumping on and off moving trolley cars at the risk of his life to make a few cents a day. Here's one final description of the child labor of that period from a 1906 book titled Bitter Cry of Children by another muckraker of the time, John Spargo. The next three photos are of coal mine trap boys who listened all day long for when a mule pulling a coal wagon would be approaching. They would open the door and then quickly close it again when the load had passed through to preserve the ventilation in the deep mine shafts as much as possible. Spargo wrote about one of these boys. I met one little fellow, 10 years old, in Mount Carbon, West Virginia last year, who was employed as a trap boy. Think of what it means to be a trap boy at 10 years of age. It means to sit alone in a dark mine passage, hour after hour, with no human soul near, to see no living creature except the mules as they pass with their loads, or a rat or two seeking to share one's meal. 
to stand in water or mud that covers the ankles, chilled to the marrow by the cold draft that rush in when you open the trap door for the mules to pass through. To work for 14 hours, waiting, opening and shutting a door, then waiting again for 60 cents to reach the surface when all is wrapped in the mantle of night and to fall to the earth exhausted and have to be carried away to the nearest shack, to be revived before it's possible to walk to the farther shack called home. So, while vast numbers of American families were living lives on the edge of destitution, while tens of thousands of American children like those we've seen were working for a few cents an hour for work shifts lasting 12 or 14 hours long or more, what became of the American pseudo-royalty during the period of the Great Depression of the 1890s and on into the 1900s? Nothing. It was business and pleasure as usual for most of them. The reality is, while those American kids and their parents were toiling away in the 1890s in the mines and mills and factories and sweatshops for slave labor wages, the people of the American pseudo-royalty in New York were building mansions, throwing lavish parties, and making glamorous memories to be passed down to their pampered posterity, and being breathlessly written up in the newspapers of the time and photographed by the finest photographers. Yes, just like the Russian royalty across the ocean at the turn of the century, the best thing the wannabe royals of the U.S. could think to do while the peasants were desperate just to get enough bread to survive was to, of course, throw a lavish costume ball and invite your friends and family. In early 1897, this breathless, gushing statement that future generations will date every event in relation to the Bradley Martin Ball appeared in a New York City gossip sheet called Town Topics. It let all its readers know about the biggest ball of them all coming up in the social whirl of the wealthiest of the wealthy of New York. The statement sure seems a pretty high estimation of a social event. Admittedly, ancient societies often dated events in relation to what year of the reign of King so-and-so had happened, but the thought that future generations in America would date every event in light of a high society party attended by a few hundred people in the 1890s in the midst of a Great Depression devastating the country, this is surely over the top. But then again, the kind of stunts the American royalty wannabes of the time pulled were over the top much of the time, which I think is one of the main reasons people nowadays ignorantly speak of the 1890s as the gay 90s. It was full of gaiety for a favored few, such as the groups of wealthy young adults who joined in a fad called slumming that started in the 1880s became very popular by the 1890s and continued all the way into the 1920s. That's where groups of them got together to visit the sleazier parts of big cities, sometimes even accompanied by bodyguards, to have risque experiences at such venues as multiracial saloons and raunchy vaudeville shows. Shows perhaps featuring well-known professional performers that in modern times are referred to as drag queens. Just why did the wealthy people of 1897 think that we, of later generations, should be all that agog still about something called the Bradley Martin Ball? Just what was the Bradley Martin Ball all about? I don't know about you, but I've heard, at least in passing since childhood, of names of such really, really rich people of the Victorian era as John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and Cornelius Vanderbilt. But until recently, I'd never heard of Bradley Martin and his wife, Cornelia. Here they are. Bradley and Cornelia started out their marriage with a bit of inherited wealth from both sides of the family, still only enough to reach the lower rungs of the richness ladder of the time, 
lower high class, I guess. Then Cornelius' dad died in 1881. He had been thought at the time to only have a fortune of about $200,000, which would be the equivalent of about $6 million today. But at the reading of the will, it was revealed old dad had a fortune squirreled away that no one knew about. And he left the bulk of it, $6 million or so, worth about $185 million today to Cornelia. The couple took an extended European vacation shortly after that. And at some point, evidently in order to give some sort of faux European lilt to their names, they inexplicably chose to tack a hyphen between Bradley Martin's first and last name and began referring to themselves as a couple as the Bradley Martins. Not quite the same idea as the modern habit of referring to a famous couple by a name mashup like Brangelina for Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, but probably in the same ballpark. Once they got the European vacation out of the way and were back in the States, it became obvious that Cornelia had aspirations to fulfill. As explained in a brief biographical sketch of the Bradley Martins in the February 7, 1897 edition of the New York Times, in the winter and spring of 1883, Cornelia's name began to appear among, as the saying goes, the patronesses of fashionable entertainments. She started out gradually giving lavish dinners and small balls, but by late 1896 she had her sights set on the heights, as described in this snippet from that 1897 New York Times article regarding the Bradley Martin Ball to be held in a few days. Mrs. Martin is credited with two separate ambitions, which, it is said, induced her to give the coming ball. These are, first, a desire to round off her society career in New York with the most superb entertainment the city has ever seen, and the second, a wish to have her ball surpass the famous Vanderbilt one in 1883. That 1883 New York City costume ball had been planned by Alva Vanderbilt, wife of William K. Vanderbilt, allegedly as a housewarming celebration for their new Fifth Avenue mansion. The event had cost the Vanderbilts the equivalent of $6 million in 20th century dollars, including the equivalent of over $1.5 million worth of champagne. Alva herself came to her ball dressed as a Venetian Renaissance lady. The costumes of the other thousand or so guests ranged from the ridiculous... Miss Kate Strong wearing a dead taxidermy cat as a headpiece, which had a collar matching her own neckpiece, who dubbed herself Puss, to the splendiferous Alva Vanderbilt's sister-in-law Alice, who came as electric light in a yellow satin dress decorated with glass pearls and beads in a lightning bolt pattern with an actual electric bulb with batteries hidden within the folds of her dress that she could turn on and hold aloft. That 1883 ball was a tough act to follow, but Cornelia Martin ultimately succeeded in her quest to best Alva Vanderbilt. She managed to blow the equivalent of almost nine million modern dollars on a single evening to entertain fewer than 800 guests. That comes to over 11,000 modern dollars per guest for a ball that lasted about five hours. The event was held in the newly completed Waldorf Astoria Luxury Hotel on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Guests were requested to come in costumes that impersonated famous people from the 16th through the 18th century. Most chose to impersonate royalty. Cornelia pretty much handed carte blanche to the hotel's staff to spend whatever it took to make the ballroom and adjacent areas of the hotel look sort of like the Palace of Versailles in France as it would have appeared during the reign of the Sun King, King Louis XIV in the 1700s. Here's how Cornelius' brother-in-law, Thomas Martin, wrote of the event in his memoirs years later. The best way I can describe what is always known as the Bradley Martin Ball is to say that it reproduced the splendor of Versailles in New York, and I doubt if even the Sun King himself ever witnessed a more dazzling sight. The interior of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel was transformed into a replica of Versailles and rare tapestries, beautiful flowers, and countless lights 
made an effective background for the wonderful gowns and their wearers. I do not think there has ever been a greater display of jewels before or since. In many cases, the diamond buttons worn by the men represented thousands of dollars, and the value of the historic gems worn by the ladies baffles description. Yes, baffles description is probably a good way to put it. Not only did the richest families of New York pull out their own family heirlooms to bedeck themselves, they seem to have raided the attics of their wealthy aristocratic buddies from all over the country. Here's how the New York Times writer put it in his pre-ball wrap-up on the morning of February 10th. His reference in this article to our 400 folks is the way people of the time referred to the New York aristocracy, also spoken of as New York high society. It was so exclusive that for a long time, it only included a carefully selected group of 400 or so super rich, super aristocratic snobs. Even when eventually a few more newly rich families were finally allowed to become part of it, the old nickname of the 400 stuck. I know of cases where family jewels and other finery have been drafted into the service from friends east, west, and south. You know, some of the old Southern families, especially in Maryland, South Carolina, and Georgia, have very valuable gems and heirlooms that date back to colonial days, and they managed to preserve them during the dreadful times of the war. Now, some of our 400 folks in days gone by have been on such intimate terms with their Southern friends and have managed to entertain them so handsomely that it comes hard to refuse when they make special requests for loans of their treasures. Some of the old Oglethorpe gems from Georgia and the Fairfax gems from Virginia and a lot of rare old bracelets and brooches from Savannah will figure in the Bradley Martin pageant and go to swell Gotham's reputation for antique gems. It's just dreadful to think of the way some of these guests will flash and strut in borrowed plumage of all sorts. Family heirlooms they never had the least right or title to wear in public. But how else do you impersonate European royalty if you haven't got a huge amount of bling? Among the women, there were at least 50 Marie Antoinettes present that evening, 10 Madame Pompadours, 3 Catherine the Greats, 1 Queen Louise of Prussia in the 1600s, and countless other queens, princesses, and other assorted royalty. Among the men, famous robber baron banker J.P. Morgan showed up as French playwright and actor of the 1600s, Moliere. Two George Washingtons were there, along with a Henry VIII, and Bradley Martin himself did a King Louis XV impression. And the gentlemen present were not confined to old duffers. There were quite a few of young dandies, too. There was even a colonial-era Native American chief. Mrs. Bradley Martin herself held court next to her French king hubby as Mary, Queen of Scots. You can see in her portrait from that night a diamond and ruby necklace made up of two bracelets actually owned originally by the daughter of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Just as an aside about the unusual costume, here's what Mary, Queen of Scots looked like in a typical Victorian era painting. I've looked all over and I can't find any painting of Mary from any period that has a dress and particularly a collar that looks any closer than this one to the one Mrs. B was wearing. But as one article on the web that I read noted, her collar and her costume portrait does bear a striking resemblance to another famous Victorian era queen. Honestly, I'm not all that convinced that some Disney artist didn't spot Mrs. B's portrait somewhere and modeled the Queen of Hearts and her amazingly high collar after it. In addition to that necklace made of French royalty bracelets, she was literally bedecked that night with lots more of the French Crown Jewel Collection, 
The crown jewels had been sold off in 1887 by the government of the French Republic in Paris, and Cornelia had snatched up as many goodies as she could. The night of the ball, she was also wearing a ruby cluster necklace, ropes of diamonds, a diamond tiara, a ruby cross, a diamond pear drop bodice net, an emerald diamond and pearl belt, and finally, a large diamond sunburst brooch pinned to her ample chest. The jewelry was eventually inherited by Cornelia's daughter, Cornelia. When Cornelia Jr. died in 1961, the collection was auctioned off and the diamond sunburst you see on Cornelia's chest in the photo was purchased by Jackie Kennedy for $50,000. Jackie was so fond of the brooch that she wore it for years with all kinds of outfits, on jackets, on hats, and even in her hair. So, what was this splendiferous ball like that was presided over by the glitzy diamond and jewel studded Cornelia? On the big night, the guests all arrived around 11 p.m. They were ushered in to be presented before the queen of the ball by a lackey who announced their real names and faux identities. Once that process was done, they passed through all the decorated areas so they could be impressed by the flowers and greenery for the shindig, which also cost a fortune. Here's part of how the Times described the lavishness and expense of all the decorations in an article published the day of the ball. By the way, the upcoming color photo you will see of the banquet tables bedecked with red and yellow roses is from a recreation of the Bradley Martin Ball from a section of a National Geographic video series called Party Like the Rich and Famous. In addition to the 400-odd people employed here doing the decorating of the Waldorf ahead of time, a great army of poor folks in Alabama have been engaged in gathering clematis vines for the affair. An enormous drain has been made for the flowers, not only on all the florists in this region, but on neighboring cities as well. The hunt for orchids, and thousands will be required in the decoration scheme, has been prosecuted at Albany, Rochester, and several other points, while the large hothouses in Washington, D.C. have been forced to the limit, not only of orchids, but on all the floral beauties to be drafted into the service. In the supper room, the decorations will consist of American beauties, a profusion of yellow roses, and a liberal display of the dainty white mimosa sprays grown specially for this occasion. Along with everything else about the preparations, the florist was told to spare no expense. And certainly no expense was spared for food and drink either. There was a copious quantity of the finest whiskey, brandy, and wines flowing all night long. But beyond that, the 700 or so guests consumed 4,000 bottles of the most expensive sparkling wine known in the U.S. at the time. That comes out to over five bottles per person for a party that lasted barely five hours. Nah, surely they couldn't have been that piggish, could they? Well, they seem to have packed away a lot more than just gallons of champagne. There were a number of pre-ball dinner parties at various mansions in the city, and thus most ballgoers had already eaten a regular dinner before arriving at the Waldorf. But that didn't seem to dampen their appetites. Around midnight, everyone gathered in the ballroom to do some fancy dancing. This is also a photo of a recreation of the National Geographic video series. After everyone tired of the dancing, the doors were opened at 1 a.m. to the banquet room, inviting everyone to what was termed the supper. Here's the menu. I can't read French, although I do recognize Tutti Frutti and Bonbons, but with the help of Google Translate, as well as some articles in English that describe details of the ball, I figured out that the words on the menu indicate, among other things, beef fillets, tortoise, lobster Newburgh, caviar stuffed oysters, roast suckling pig, and canvas back duck stuffed with truffles and plover's eggs. Why am I put in mind of a 1980 Saturday Night Live skit featuring people in a supposed Roman vomitorium, allegedly a place with troughs, where people at a Roman pig out could go between courses of the banquet and gag it all up so they could go back in and eat more? <laughs> 
I've read that although some piggish ancient Romans actually did do this sort of thing at times, the idea that they actually had special rooms for it is just an urban legend. Here's a pic of that skit with Lorraine Newman and guest Burt Reynolds. But no, I'm pretty sure the Waldorf Astoria didn't have any vomitorium rooms. Although it is probably a good thing they featured indoor plumbing by that time, as I am also quite convinced that at least some barfing went on that night after some faux royals washed down their third serving of suckling pig and tutti frutti with their third bottle of the finest champagne in America. Bradley Martin's brother Thomas commented in his memoir about the criticisms the ball had received in the press. He then gave a very vivid description of the shindig, with details such as those we've already covered, and concluded with his own observation, which may or may not have been tinged with sarcasm. The power of wealth, with its refinement and vulgarity, was everywhere. It gleamed from countless jewels, and it was proclaimed by the thousands of orchids and roses whose fragrance that night was like incense burnt on the altar of the golden calf. I cannot conceive why this entertainment should have been condemned, we Americans are so accustomed to display that I should have thought the ball would not have been regarded as anything very unusual. Yeah, why should there have been any naysaying? Why the event provided employment for a whole great army of poor people down in Alabama? Who, I'll bet, made at least 50 cents apiece picking clematis vines? It might have even paid better than what this family of the 1890s got picking cotton. Nothing like trickle-down economics. Why on earth would anyone criticize someone for burning huge piles of their own money to throw a five-hour party for a passel of drunken gluttons dripping in jewels? Why, it's the American way. Certainly wouldn't want to put a guilt trip on these folks who were just spending their own hard-earned money. Well, not money actually earned by hard work. To impress their peers. Why would anyone resent that? Well, maybe because of this. The New York Evening World newspaper back then mentioned how $10,000 in 1897 dollars could be used. Multiply each of these examples by 35 to arrive at how far the cost of the Bradley Martin Ball, $350,000 in 1897 dollars, could have gone if spent elsewhere. 10000 could pay the average wages of 18 New York working men for a year. Pay the average wages of 6,240 working men for a day. Support a family at average working men's wages for 15 years. Buy half a ton of coal for each of 7,000 families. Now multiply all that by 35. But there's no evidence that the ball attendees gave even a passing thought about these matters having to do with the masses of peons. As the 50 Marie Antoinette wannabes at the gay 90s Bradley Martin Ball might have put it, let them eat cake. Speaking of the peons, at that 1903 ball at the Winter Palace in Russia, the peons, if they tried, might have been able to glimpse the Romanovs and their guests dancing through the huge uncovered windows of the palace. But at the Waldorf Astoria in New York in 1897, the unwashed masses were not afforded even a tiny glimpse of all the American aristocracy and their finery, let alone a chance to see them dance. Guests were driven right up to the main entrance of the Waldorf and whisked right in. They either had cloaks on covering their lavish costumes and all their bling, or brought in trunks with what they needed and used dressing rooms in the hotel to bedeck themselves. No, you couldn't peek in a window either, even with binoculars from an upper floor of a nearby building. The Waldorf management arranged to board up all the windows of the first and second floors where the festivities were taking place. You couldn't even get close to the building without an invite that night. Teddy Roosevelt, who was president of the Board of Police Commissioners at the time, stationed something like 200 police around the building and lining the sidewalks and ordered the street barricaded in front of the hotel and positioned what he described as 10 of his tallest men on either side of the walk guests would have to take from the curb to the doorway. It would seem to be that all this was because there was kind of a gut feeling in New York 
that just maybe the starving masses might not be too impressed with such an extravagant display of excess flaunted right in the middle of their abject misery. Both before and after the ball, there was a lot of grumbling in pulpits of some churches and in editorials in some papers across the country about how arrogant and thoughtless and lacking in discretion such a blatant display of excess of greed and conspicuous consumption was in the midst of the economic desperation of so many. The New York Times edition of January 23, 1897, quoted one minister three weeks before the event, who strongly approved of a critical sermon delivered from the pulpit by another clergyman the previous Sunday to a prominent New York City church congregation made up of wealthy New Yorkers. The Reverend Dr. Madison G. Peters expressed himself without hesitation. With all the people who have to lie awake nights contriving to spend their time and their money, and all the others who lie awake wondering how they may get food, there is danger in the air. All history teaches us that the concentration of wealth is the forerunner of social upheaval. This is an instance that may set people thinking, and if it is not taken in the right way, it will give rise to bitter thoughts. The situation is more serious than many suppose. But of course, this didn't put a dent in Cornelia's plans, nor in the enthusiasm of the Times newspaper itself for cataloging every minute detail of the plans as seen in this article three days before the ball. It concluded excruciatingly detailed explanations of the planned exceedingly expensive decorations and an alphabetized directory of many of the attendees, describing in detail who they would be impersonating for the night, what their costume looked like, and especially how jewel-encrusted they would be. Nor did it keep the paper from spending a whole page of paragraphs in its February 12th issue, giving a blow-by-blow -blow account of how everything went down on the grand night, including the bit of a scandal caused by the young male artist from Boston who impersonated a 15th century Italian falconer. The large stuffed falcon perched on his wrist would have been enough to call attention to him, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was his skin-tight costume of tights and a short jacket that was said to have left little about his figure to the imagination. It was said to have been historically correct in every detail, but was, as the Times put it, so decidedly pronounced that he caused a sensation wherever he moved. At 4 a.m., a large proportion of the guests began departing for home. The Bradley Martins had originally planned to leave about then and had instructed their carriage driver to come fetch them at that time. But there was one last activity planned for whoever was willing to stay around longer a very early breakfast featuring tasty dishes of wild game, and Cornelia was evidently unwilling to miss out on that part of the festivities, so they ended up staying until 6 a.m., meaning that their poor carriage driver and his horses had to sit in the deep freeze of a snowy New York early morning in February for two hours waiting. Even after Cornelia and Bradley departed, 20 or 30 male guests were still left sitting around three tables in the dining room, regaling each other with stories, including the giant Indian warrior chief and a poet regaling his stuffed owl with orations. They kept more than just a driver and horses waiting. The whole housekeeping staff at the Waldorf, who had no doubt already worked very hard all night long, had to stand around waiting for these dudes to finish chowing down on venison and such and drinking their last bottles of champagne well past 6 a.m. before they could begin cleaning up after the revelers. Yes, the high society ball goers in New York City that night had a splendiferous time while the peons in the slums of New York went right on freezing and starving meekly and quietly. There was no protest on the streets at all. American royalty were very accustomed to the American peons mostly starving meekly and quietly throughout the Gilded Age, which lasted from about 1870 to the early 1900s. But there's a kind of irony to it all. 
As you may recall, there were at least 50 Marie Antoinettes at the ball that night. Were they that dense about history? Were they unfamiliar with the end of the real Marie Antoinette, who was very much into the same kind of lavish spending as Cornelia Bradley Martin? But of course, that had been a whole century earlier and happened far across the ocean, so I guess their complacency was understandable. And it is understandable that one would not expect their complacency to change much from the time of the Bradley Martin Ball in 1897 up through the entry of the U.S. into the World War 30 years later in 1917. Oh, there was the occasional strike against some factory or mine by downtrodden and poverty-stricken workers, sometimes stopped by the National Guard being called in and maybe killing a few strikers and or their wives and children, but those were isolated incidents. Nothing to worry about. But then, in 1917, huge numbers of downtrodden and poverty-stricken Russians revolted against their country's privilege, royalty, and aristocracy. Tsar Nicholas was forced to abdicate his throne, and he and his family were snatched from their privileged lifestyle and turned into prisoners. This made the headlines in the New York papers, which no doubt made a lot of American royalty and aristocracy nervous, even those who knew little or nothing about history. This wasn't the distant past. This was now. The situation in Russia deteriorated over the coming two years, and word that not just the Tsar, but his whole family had been assassinated by the Bolsheviks in 1918, finally became common knowledge. At that point, nervousness no doubt intensified into anxiety in the circles of the elegant aristocracy of America. Bradley Martin himself didn't have to worry about class struggles in the United States. He and Cornelia had moved to Great Britain permanently in 1899 and became a permanent part of the British aristocracy, including chumming around with Queen Victoria's son Edward, who soon became king. Bradley died in London in 1913 before the start of the Great War. As you'll note from the obituary, he was still known primarily for the fact that he gave Great Ball in 1897. Cornelia stayed in Great Britain from then on until her death in 1920. With World War I right at her doorstep in 1918, I would suppose she didn't worry much about the Russian Revolution. Once the German bombing runs by both Zeppelins and biplanes started in 1915, there was little time for the wealthy aristocracy in Britain to worry about being able to keep up an aristocratic lifestyle of leisure and hosting balls. But this was not so in the U.S. It didn't take long after the death of the Tsar in 1918 for the presence of Bolsheviks in the United States to become big news, dominating American newspaper articles and spawning ominous editorial cartoons like this one from the November 1st, 1919 New York Evening Telegram, or this major article warning about Bolshevism from the June 15th, 1919 New York Times. As unlikely as it may seem, this is the beginning of the winding thread that will meander through the subsequent century, leading eventually to the incredible situation of a huge proportion of white American evangelical Christians supporting for president a boorish, trash-talking, self-proclaimed billionaire with a reputation for flagrant immorality in an election under the shadow of strange influence from Russia. We'll move on down that winding path in the next video in this series. It's titled, Boston Bolsheviks? Thank you.